so as Lou mentioned, I'm a professor at Queensland University of Technology, and so I do research. I direct uh, the Centre for Robotic Vision, and I teach. And I teach 80 kids at a time in a classroom, and I have an online uh, teaching arm, which is able to reach a huge number of people. And I've been really impressed at how easy it is to teach at scale. If I wanted to teach a million roboticists, which I think we probably need to do, teaching 80 a year, I'm not going to live long enough. So this resource here, the Robot Academy, is something It's free, open, online resources for students who are interested in robotics is aimed at upper high school level through to uh, undergraduate level. So I'm going to talk about robotics, uh, and Lou asked me to talk about robotics and the, how robotics fits into what's going on in Africa, I've actually got no idea about, but maybe that's something that we can have a conversation about. I know about robotics, so I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about what I know of, of robotics. Uh, here's the, this is a weird button. There we go. A lot of people are surprised by this. And um, we had yesterday some talks about artificial intelligence, which was a nice introduction. So computers are much better than humans at some things like the game of chess. And we know that. We beat chess grandmasters more than 20 years ago. But the picture on the right-hand side of a young child picking up a chess piece, that is beyond current robotic capability. And it surprises a lot of people. Robots are not very good at understanding things that are in their world, not very good at visual perception, and they're also not very good at hand-eye coordination. So these are both cutting-edge research areas in robotics. So you might have heard a lot or seen a lot about robots. Uh, you've probably got to moderate your expectations about what robots can do. One day robots are going to be awesome, but today robots, sadly, are not awesome. And a lot of what you know about robots, a lot of the reasons why you think robots are awesome, is because you watch too many movies, right? Uh, so Hollywood has messed with your brains, right, and made you think that robots are far superior to what they are today. So I have to sort of burst this bubble. So here are a couple of very, very famous uh, Hollywood, Hollywood robots. And the sad reality is that they're people dressed up as robots. Right? So that's why they look intelligent, that's why they can do smart and clever looking things. It's because they're people dressed up as robots. So if we could build robots that were as good as this, we would build them, right? We'd have actual robots in the movies, but we don't. We have people dressed up as robots. It's kind of sad. The word robot actually comes from fiction. That was coined in a Czech play, which will be 100 years old next year. And it is a play about the future set in 19, the future as envisaged from 1920. And human beings are sick of manual work, manual labor, and so they create machines to do the work for them. Uh, and they're called robots, and it's from the Czech word, it means something like surf labor. It's got connotations of slavery, actually. And so these machines eventually realize how they're being used, they rise up, they kill the humans. Right? We've seen that movie probably many times with different actors and different titles. Right? It was first written in 1920. So robot is a word that comes from fiction. Important to know. This is going to state-of-the-art robotics. On the left-hand side, you can see modern manufacturing robots building Tesla motor cars at a plant in Fremont, California. So these robots are fast and strong. They can pick up car doors and move them and make them with the car body. This is the original robot technology. It's a technology that's over 60 years old now. First generation robots. They work in factories, uh, very efficient, uh, and they create a lot of value, pardon me, for the people who own those robots. On the right hand side, we have robots that are at work in Amazon fulfillment centers. So Amazon is a robot enabled business. It's enabled by cloud computing, AI, and robots. Amazon have a fleet of over 200,000 robots now of their, own, of their own design, their own manufacture. It is Amazon's secret source. So it, all these uh, uh, big shelf units, you see those yellow things there, contain a bunch of Amazon products. Robots go in, jack up the particular shelf that's needed, and bring it to the person who reaches into the shelf and takes the item that has to be dispatched to a customer, takes it out, and puts it in the shipping box. Everything is done by robots except for that last meter because robots are not very good at recognizing things and they don't have very good hand-eye coordination. So Amazon employs lots of people just taking things out of the shelf that's delivered to them by a robot and putting it in the box. 
Amazon doesn't want that situation. They're doing a lot of work to try and automate that last meter. That's a very, very hard robotics problem. Okay. So there are two examples, car manufacturing and uh, logistics, uh, very high penetration rate of robotics, but there's a ton of other industries where for the moment there is very little penetration of robotics. And this is the new frontier for us as roboticists, how do we get robots to work in these kind of industries? So you get asked the question, why are there no robots in these other, in these other industries? And that's kind of what I want to talk about next. Robotics 101, tell you a little bit about robots, how they work. The essence of any robot, any roboticist will tell you, is three things. We need to sense the world, we need to make a plan based on what we've sensed and what our goal is, and then we act, we carry it out. And I'm just going to go quickly through those three parts of the core of any robotic system. First of all, sensing. And we use vision for a large part of our situational awareness. We learn about the world around us by basically what we can see. Vision is a wonderful sensor. I can see things that are far away. I can see things that are up close. Almost all of my other sensors are very short range. If it's within my arm reach, I can touch it. If it's even closer, I can smell it. Even closer, I can taste it, right? Vision gives me a wonderful dynamic range of object distances. Uh, it's a very, very powerful sensor. And sadly, robots don't have much in the way of vision. So here are a few examples of things that we do every day without even thinking of it how we use vision. So on the left-hand side, little girl doing a Rubik's Cube. Right? So she's using her eyes to build, understand the state of the Rubik's Cube, that she can reason about it in her brain, and then with her fingers she can perform some actions and solve the Rubik's Cube. Up the top there, uh, on the right, is some person doing crazy driving. Right? But the crazy driving is entirely mediated by vision. The driver is sitting there, they're looking at the world around them through their eyes. That's the only sensor that's at play here processing that in their brain, and then moving their hands and their feet in order to control the vehicle. And down the bottom, the juggling also is a visually mediated task. Uh, you can't do it if you can't see. And so vision is something that we all take utterly for granted. And I'm going to get you at the end of this when you sort of go out and get the next cup of coffee. Just think about how often you use vision in the task to get from where you are to the coffee. Uh, we never introspect about it, but it is quite extraordinary, the capability that we have. And it's not just big, complex things like humans that use the sense of vision. Even very, very small things like bees use the sense of vision. So I've, humans who've got a brain weighs about one and a half kilos, a third of that's devoted to visual processing. It's the back third of your brain. It consumes six watts, that visual part of your brain. It's quite extraordinary. The bee has got a tiny brain. It weighs only a gram. It's got only a million neurons. Most of what a bee does involves a sense of vision. So a bee gets directions from another bee who found some interesting food. They do a dance, the, neck, the bee picks up the signal from the dance, and they, they fly. They get the direction relative to the sun using their eyes. They know the distance to fly based on how much the world moves past them as they move. It sees the flower, it recognizes the flower, moves towards it, and then it lands on the flower. All of that's done using vision with only a million neurons. Bees are quite extraordinary. Uh, in what they can do. Uh, so engineers, computer scientists have been impressed for a long time by this ability to understand pictures and understand images. And so there's really two schools of, uh, of, of effort in this, in this space, right? So one's what we call image processing. So we take an image from a camera or a multispectral image from a satellite and we process it and essentially recolor it. So what you can see on this side over here is we've taken multispectral satellite data, we've classified each pixel according to land use. So image processing, you take an image in and you output an image, it's been enhanced in some way. It might be a medical image where you've enhanced a, a defect, a tumor, something that shouldn't be there. The other side is much more interesting and much more relevant to robotics, and we call this computer vision. And this is where an image comes in, but what comes out is data. It's some kind of description about what's in the image. And that description, this concise information about what's in the image, is gold for a robot. Because otherwise, a picture is just like 10 million pixel values, amounts of red, green, and blue. It's not at all informative. I want to know that that's a person, that's a car, you know, that's a horse. That's useful information that a robot can take action on. So computer vision is absolutely critical. It's a critical sensing modality for robots. Now, there's another thing which we call robotic vision. It's very similar to computer vision, but it's got some constraints. 
for robotic vision, we need to be able to process that image really quickly. Because if a robot's going to take action based on it, it can't have taken us a minute to process the picture. If that was the case, then you know, by the time it takes an action, the world's changed. That's not, not at all helpful. Uh, so we want actionable information quickly with low latency. It needs to be very accurate. Because if you're a robot and you're making physical decisions, if you base that on inaccurate, inaccurate sensory perceptions, you're going to make an error in the physical world, and that could be bad. Other important thing for sensor is, if you can't be accurate, then at least tell me how uncertain you are about what it is you sense. In robotics, uncertainty, knowing uncertainty is very, very useful. So here are some examples of things that computer vision can do. It's not my work. This is a work now. It's quite a few years old. We can put a picture in, and we can recognize not just the objects that are in there, but the actions that are depicted within the image. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. Another example, uh, deep networks, and we heard about deep networks yesterday. You can take pictures of people and imagine where their skeleton is, you know, where their legs are and where their arms are, even if they're potentially occluded. Uh, we can get some idea of the pose of the human being, and that's really useful for robots. We can train networks for this. It's maybe not so useful for robot, but we can train networks to do even things like this, figure age and gender. Uh, we can do that, so it's not surprising that we can train a network to do that. But this gives you some idea of the state of the art of computer vision at the moment. And as a roboticist, I can harvest all the cool stuff that the computer vision people do and put, put that into my robot to make it uh, much more capable. And all this has been driven, and we talked about this yesterday, better computers, better algorithms, and stupidly large amounts of data which we can use to train these networks. It's the most effective way we have of understanding the physical world is to process images using deep networks, convolutional neural networks. They're very, very powerful. So that's the sensing bit. Uh, some robots use LIDARs, where you uh, throw beams of laser light out and time how long it takes to come back. But there's a lot of robots using cameras and deep networks to process that sensory information. So the next thing then is thinking, it's planning. So I know how the world is. I know where I am with respect to the world. I've got a goal. I've got to make a plan in order to get there. And planning used to be considered very much as an as a exercise in geometry. So what we're seeing here is uh, a, a dashboard assembly being inserted into a car. And there's lots of constraints. That's a difficult thing to get that uh, car component in through, in through the gap and then sort of wiggle it down on top of the levers that are already assembled in the car. Uh, so these problems of solving uh, geometric, uh, geometric planning problems have been used in robotics now for, for more than a decade. And we've got wonderful algorithms now that can solve these kinds of problems very, very quickly and very efficiently. I mentioned before about uncertainty. So roboticists now are big disciples of uncertainty, Bayes' law, and so on. And this was probably a revolution in robotics 10, 15 years ago, where we, and where we realized that the sensory information we get about the world is not perfect. But we can say something about how imperfect it is. We can put distributions on this data that we get from the sensors, and then we can reason about the uncertainty. Uh, and that was a very, very powerful step in the evolution of robotic capability. Now, this next thing is what's really happening now in robotics. Uh, it's called reinforcement learning. So if I wanted to program this little robot to walk, the old-fashioned way to do that would be to write some equations that described how its legs moved, right? And then apply physics and math to say, well, OK, if it's going to stand up, its center of gravity has got to be um, in between its two legs. And if it's going to move dynamically, then I've got to take momentum into account. With reinforcement learning, we don't do any of those things. We simply apply. Uh, a reward function. And we reward this robot if it moves forward and doesn't fall over. And then, just by a huge amount of physical physics-based simulation, over time, and this is now at Epoch 4000, uh, it's starting to walk. It's not very elegant, it's not very graceful, but the reward function could have not only the fact that it stays upright and moves forward for a long period of time, but perhaps you could say something about how graceful the motion is as well. And so this is the new way of thinking about programming robots. We don't think about the mechanism and write the maths anymore. We do it in simulation, and we learn in a virtual world. And once we've trained it in the virtual world, we can put it in the real world. And it's a pretty good starting point. And then we can do more learning in the real world. Big revolution in our field. So that's the thinking part. The last part's the acting part. How is it that a robot 
perform some action. So ultimately, there's some electric motors uh, in there that move stuff. Uh, the robot might have motors that drive propellers, uh, might have motors that drive legs. Uh, this robot here is sort of like a monkey bar robot, and there's a, a robot boat and a, ro and a robot submarine. So there are lots of different mechanisms that a robot could use to move through the physical world. And I'll, I'll give you some more examples of these. You might have seen some of these things on YouTube. Boston Dynamics is pretty prolific. Uh, a, awesome robots in B, uh, YouTube videos. Uh, so this is the Wildcat, which can run 48 kilometers an hour. Uh, I think it's the fastest legged robot on the planet. This is a little guy called Big Dog. Oh, sorry, this is Little Dog. And this was nearly 10 years old now, but it did some amazing research into figuring out if you're walking over rough terrain, where should I put my feet? We can do that, sort of take that capability for granted. But for robots, this was, a, this was a breakthrough. And you can see the sorts of maneuvers that it does to get over very rough terrain. Engineers have played a lot with robots that look like people. And so this is a very old robot from Honda, uh, which by sort of modern standards is pretty, is pretty clunky, but it was one of the first somewhat capable humanoid robots. Uh, here are more capable humanoid robots, much scarier to look at. Uh, and you know, the, I think the, the visual appearance of a robot is important if you want it to engage with humans. The previous robot is probably something you might want to have a conversation with, and this one perhaps not so. Uh, this is just outrageously fast and strong, uh, but awesome in terms of robotic capability. You know, two years ago, this was impossible for robots to do. Uh, today, it's becoming somewhat, somewhat routine. Uh, another robot from Boston Dynamics, a smaller legged robot uh, for in sort of indoor applications. Can I talk a little bit about flying robots because that's an important modality for, for robots today. And there's all sorts of different shapes and forms of flying robots, just as there is for flying vehicles in general. So we can have robotic blimps, we can have robotic fixed wing aeroplanes, we can have robotic helicopters, uh, coax co helicopters and so on. Uh, here's an example of some work from ETH from a few years ago. It's basically a flying tennis racket, uh, able to do tasks like juggling. Some other examples, one from ETH, one from University of Pennsylvania. The one on the left is little, little drones picking up blocks and putting them into a big complex stack. So you can imagine this in a building scenario. The one on the right-hand side is a bunch of drones strapped to a big uh, piece of material. You can imagine this in a construction scenario. A bunch of drones would fly something up in a construction site instead of having to use a crane. So these are people just exploring the edge of robotic capability uh, in the flying robot space. This is one that I really like. This is a robot with a pump on board that's doing water sampling. So if you wanted to sample water from the middle of a lake, the traditional approach would be you go out in the boat with some people and you take a water sample. This is a quad, uh, quadcopter that flies out, drops a hose into the lake, slurps up some water, and then brings it back to shore. Uh, so it's really only kind of limited by your imagination what these sorts of robotic technologies can be applied to. Some examples of underwater robots. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is one uh, that I developed in a previous job, uh, and some other commercial robots shown there as well. This is a, a robot you can buy off the shelf. You can drop it in the water. It goes for eight hours. It measures a whole bunch of water physical and chemical properties, as well as building up a three-dimensional model of the terrain that it's flying over. So you could put it into a lake, you get a model of the lake, and tell you all about the water quality through the lake. Uh, commercial off-the-shelf robot. This is some work of a colleague of mine, Matthew uh, Dumbabin. Uh, these are robotic boats, and we again use this for water sampling in a lake because the water quality isn't the same in all parts of the lake. And so he's done interesting work looking at methane emission from these kind of lakes and find that methane bubbles up according to the time of day and according to the water depth, which is something you would never have found out unless you had a robot that monotonously, monotonously went around and sampled the water at all points at all times of day. One person going out in a rowboat to collect one water sample would miss all of that other information, the complex spatio-temporal signature would be completely missed. So this is the sort of work that robots can do really well, gathering data about the physical world. I want to make this point. The word robot gets misused a lot, and people talk about chatbots and search bots and things like that. To my mind, they're not bots. And AI is artificial intelligence that manipulates information only. It's completely virtual, pushes bytes and bits around inside a computer. A robot is a physical thing. 
right? It's AI inside of a machine, and it moves. It has got a physical embodiment. It moves in the physical world, and it manipulates or changes the physical world. And to me, it's this physicality that's the important difference between a robot and an AI system. Okay, so as I said, autonomous robots that we have there on the left-hand side. It's an AI system with an arm, or it's an AI system with legs. Sometimes we have things called telerobots, and a telerobot is, if you like, a partnership between an AI and a human. There are some things that AIs can do really well, and some things that humans can do really well. So a partnership we refer to as a telerobot. So the surgical application you see here, the surgeon is ultimately in control, but the AI is doing things like stopping him, moving a tool where it shouldn't be, can remove hand tremor and things like that. So it's a partnership where each does what it does best. There's another class of robots which is quite interesting. We call them exoskeletons. So it's a robot that you wear, and again, the, the human wearer is in charge of the robot. The robot follows really closely, so it's a really close dance between the wearer and the robot. But if I'm doing a task like picking up a box, I'm going to use my superior vision system and my superior reasoning capability to reach over and pick up the right box. And when I lift it, the robot's going to follow me, but it's going to take the load. So I'm not going to hurt my back. The robot's going to protect my back. I'm doing the smart things. It's doing the brawny things. So again, it's another kind of partnership between robot and uh, and human. I want to quickly whiz through uh, what's happened in the robotics field uh, over over decades. Really, the first generation of robots that I talked right about talked about right at the beginning. The robots that live in factories and build cars. Uh, and their number has in increased steadily over time, uh, but they're not the most dominant robots on the planet at the moment. So this graph here shows where robots of that kind are being used. Automotive manufacturing is big. Electronic manufacturing is starting to eclipse the automotive industry, uh, and we see there the penetration across different kinds of regions. Uh, and you can see that Asia and Europe have got you know, massive penetration of robots in their manufacturing industry, which is probably not surprising. These kind of robots, the manufacturing robots, they can't see. They really don't know what's going on around them. They're fast. They're strong. They're scary. They'll hurt you. So we lock them up. We put them in cages or behind light barriers so that they can't hurt people. And that's problematic because many of us want robots like this, right? Robots that can perhaps help us in our daily life. Uh, if a robot's in a cage, you can't do any of these things. So the big frontier for us at the moment is how do we get robots that can work closely with humans and do things that are maybe human-like. This is a few years old now. This video, but it shows how tedious、uh, it is for a robot to do a task that we can do quite easily, like folding a shirt.、Uh, this is、uh, still an enormously difficult task for a robot to do. Uh, but this is a human-friendly robot. I can be quite close to this robot, and if it would touch me, it can detect that, and it would stop moving. Right. So we are now moving into a phase of human-friendly robots, and this has then launched another whole area of robotics we call service robots. So instead of robots that work in factories and build stuff, we want robots that provide a service directly to humans. We call these service robots. So we have robot vacuum cleaners,、uh, robot fetch and carry in hotels.、Uh, Telepresence robots. So you can be, you can visit a meeting、uh, from a remote location just by using the app, and you can drive the robot around and talk to people.、Uh, it's like Skype on wheels.、Uh, pretty impressive. Service robots, medical medical service robots. We've got surgery.、Uh, you've got telehealth in the middle,、uh, and you've got on the right hand side an autonomous cart that can carry food or linen or specimens or drugs around the hospital. So instead of having to have nurses or orderlies pushing stuff around, a robot can do that. That's what robots are. Robots are particularly good at. Self-driving cars is another robot technology that provides an advantage directly to humans. Service robots、uh, are much in the news. Port logistics. The Port of Brisbane、uh, has a whole bunch of these or big orange robots that move containers around the port. So a crane drops them on the quayside. Robot picks them up, puts them in stacks, takes them off stacks, and puts them on trucks. Uh, all autonomous robots have been looked at for、uh, demolition and construction,、uh, undersea operations. So the oil and gas industry use a lot of robots like this to do stuff at water levels where human beings would be crushed. Right?、Uh, forestry is another big application area.、Uh, bomb disposal, mining.、Uh, mining is an area where 
people are potentially at risk uh, and where, in my country at least, we can't get enough people to work in the mines. So this basically is a, a, vac a labour vacuum and robots are being sucked in to do the work that in the old days human beings would do. Planetary exploration, uh, again, putting capability where humans cannot yet go. Uh, it's easier to send a robot to do this kind of work. So the old style robots, the first generation robots, were arms that worked in factories. More recently, we have this capability of robots that can move around the environment. We call them mobile robots, for obvious reasons. And so we've now got this sort of class of robots we call service robots. We've got a big class of robots that can move around, we call them mobile robots. And then there's an interesting sort of set in the middle. These are mobile robots that perform a service, vacuum cleaning, pizza delivery, and so on. And then we've got another class of robots over here we call field robots. So these are robots that work outdoors, not in factories, farms, forests, mines. Uh, and this is a really important area for robotic, uh, robotic application. But for doing all of these things, the robot has to do those three tasks that I talked about earlier, has to be able to sense and, and think, plan, and act, right? And the sensing is really, really critical. I'll talk about some case studies. So these are things from my own lab uh, that we've been, been working on. So first I'll talk a little bit about underwater robots and some of the capability. So this is a robot we developed in our lab with some funding from Google. Uh, this is a robot that's got a lot of cameras in. It's got two cameras in the front so it can not run into stuff. It's got two cameras underneath so it can figure out how high it is above the seabed and how it's moving with respect to the seabed. Uh, and we're using this for applications like coral reef monitoring. Uh, the health of the Great Barrier Reef is uh, really, to be honest, not very good. Uh, and so it's important that we survey, monitor its health on a fairly regular basis. And that's too expensive to do with human labour. Robots can do that job very, very nicely. This is some work that we can do, taking imagery from a robot like that. Right? What we can do is we can build really accurate three-dimensional models of a swath of the reef, and then we can compare it from one year to the next. In three-dimensional terms, we can see whether some of those structures have grown or whether they've shrunk or died. So we can do rigorous longitudinal studies based on the sort of data that we would get from a robot like that. Some other things we can do, we can do population uh, population monitoring, and we look for things like starfish, we can look for other sorts of organisms. We can count them as we're going along. The robot's like a marine scientist. It's going along, using its eyes, and, giving, and comes back and says, I saw so many starfish and so many this and so many that. This is a, a project uh, that are followed on from some of those other capabilities. It's to do with this particular organism called a crown of thorn starfish, which is kind of in the news a lot in Australia at the moment. And the reason it is, is because uh, it's, in, it's a native species, but it's in probably plague proportion. It comes out and it eats coral. So a lovely coral reef that's all colourful with little fish turns into some kind of coral desert. And the reason this is happening is because we've messed with the environment of the reef, right? We've made the water too warm, we've made it too acid, there's nutrient runoff from the farms in Australia, the coral is weak, starfish sense opportunity and they come out. And so some uh, scientists in Australia developed a toxin that could be injected into the starfish. This has all been done with the appropriate ethical clearances and considerations. Uh, and so human beings could go and jab starfish. The reef is massive, right? So this absolutely does not scale. Uh, and I should say it's also it's a band-aid measure. But as roboticists, we look at this and think, well, maybe you could get a robot to do that. So this is a robot that we developed a few years ago. It's not in production. But this is the view from the uh, cameras on the robot looking down. It saw a starfish there. You saw it got a bit excited, put a, put a red cross on it. Uh, the robot has an injection system. So there's this little arm on the bottom, uh, operated by compressed air. It can reach down and jab a thing. Uh, and in the next bit, you'll see it uh, detect a starfish, reach down and jab it. So I'm not quite sure what I think about a robot that does these things. I mean, it's not solving the problem, which is to stop warming the planet. Uh, and maybe it's a band-aid, it's kind of a band-aid measure, but it would potentially keep the reef alive for longer. Uh, so it's an example of what a robot can do. Again, we've got deep learning here. We trained this robot to recognize starfish by giving it lots and lots of examples of starfish. Agriculture, big, thing, big industry in Australia, and agriculture over many decades has been driven by developments in these three areas. If you look at agricultural labour in the United States over 
almost two centuries, we see that it's dropped to about 3% of what it was 200 years ago because of innovations in mechanization, genetics, um, and herbicides. We've made machines bigger and bigger as we've got better and better engines and better material technology. And we pour a ton of herbicide onto, onto the crop, uh, which is a problem I'll get to in a moment. But the reason that we've made the machines bigger and bigger is because there's a, there's a driver here. So if we want this driver, this farmer, to get as much land covered as possible in a day, we make the machine as wide as possible and as fast as possible. And you think, well, you don't need a driver. Could you actually think about a new approach to doing this, uh, this task like weeding? There's big problems with, uh, with making machines big. Uh, if it's been raining, you take them out, they'll get bogged. Uh, they crush the ground that they drive on, which ruins the root, st root structure of plants. So there's, there are quite a few disadvantages. And also, because we've been pouring poison on plants for 50 years, they have developed resistance. And this is a big problem in Australia, Canada, and the United States. So there are now species of weed that we cannot kill with the herbicides that we use today. And the only other herbicides in our arsenal are so nasty, we don't dare spray them. So we've created a massive problem for ourselves by indiscriminately pouring large amounts of herbicide on the land for, for decades. So what can we do about that? One thought is that instead of big robot, sorry, one big robot, one big machine, we could have lots of little machines. And so we could divide the work up and spread it across lots of machines. So if one of those machines breaks and you've got 20, you're down 5% of your capability. If you've got one big machine and it breaks, you're down 100% of your capability until you can get it fixed. So there's a sort of robustness about this. The machines don't crush the ground. They could go more slowly, and they could pay more attention to what it is that they're seeing. So instead of just spraying everything, they could actually look at what's going on. And so that's what this robot does. It's developed in our lab. And in a moment, you'll see uh, the robot's eye view. This is looking down at the ground, sees individual plants, Again, using machine learning techniques to classify each individual plant. Is it a weed or is it the plant that I want? And once we've made that decision, then we can decide on a means to kill that particular plant. We could put poison just on that particular plant, or we could actually mechanically till it out of the, till it out of the ground. So here you see uh, the robot, and I think here you see some precision application of herbicide. We can reduce herbicide usage by over 90% just by spraying it where it's needed rather than everywhere. Just not a particular, it's not rocket science, uh, but it hasn't yet been done. And this is the tilling array. So it, if there's a weed that's not, pos it's not easy to spray, uh, we can just whack it uh, and chip it out of the ground so that it will die. And you know, it, it will be reabsorbed into the ground as nutrient. So that's what we can do uh, for agriculture. The robot, as it's moving along, it just builds up this great big photo mosaic. Uh, it's a bit like an aerial photo that's taken from the robot, and we can use that to uh, provide the farmer with some intelligence about what's going on in their farm, a really detailed, high-resolution map. Uh, this, is, this video takes a rather, rather long time to run, but this is the robot coming back to recharge. It's electrically powered, uh, and it lives in a shipping container, a 40-foot shipping container with solar arrays on the top. So it does a little maneuver here and actually drives itself into the container and charges itself up. And it can also automatically replenish itself with herbicide. So the idea is that this is something you could just leave out on, in the farm. Uh, when it was tired, it would come back and recharge, and it would just go out and do more work all by itself with no, no human intervention at all. So there it is going into its house. So that's what we call broadacre agriculture. Uh, it's a big industry in Australia, uh, crops like, like wheat in particular. This robot is a, was designed to pick caps, what we call pep, capsicums. Uh, South Africans call them capsicums? Green peppers, or red peppers, exactly. So here's the robot, it's got a camera on the top, there's a camera there and it's moving around trying to get a good view. That's what the robot's perception of the scene is, so you can see the fruit there. And using three-dimensional information, texture and colour, we can make a decision about where the fruit is. We reach in, we grab it with a suction gripper, uh, and then we have a mechanical saw which cuts through the stalk, and then the robot is left holding the capsicum in its, in its hand. In Australia, a job, like, a job like this, we can't find people who want to do this work. Uh, this is, we're an incredibly urbanised country, 
All right, so I think more urbanised than many other countries. So although the image, the stereotype of Australia is, you know, the, the great big outback, everyone wants to live in the cities where the Wi-Fi and the coffee is good. No one wants to go and work out here, right, where, where the work needs to be done. And, you know, we don't have, we don't have guest workers. Uh, we've got an island. It, you know, we, there's, there's no one to do the work. And so, you know, robots is potentially a, a way of doing, doing this uh, physical labour. I'm going to skip over that one. And I just want to finish up with a few thoughts, maybe that pick up on some things that have been said over, over today and, and yesterday about robots, the good and the bad. Uh, and though I've been doing robotics for a long time, there are some aspects of the field that, to be honest, keep me awake at night. Uh, I worry a little bit about what it is that we're doing. So let's try and just go through a few of these. The good. People are really excited about robotics as a business. People see huge opportunities. Uh, you know, we've Everyone's got a computer, everyone's got multiple computers, everyone's got lots of software. The next frontier for things that we can sell people is going to be robots. Uh, so there's a lot of VC money going into robotics at the moment, all around the world, uh, particularly in the west coast of the United States and quite a bit in Europe. So people are very excited about robotics. Robotics as a service is a thing now. So we had uh, software as a service, now we have robotics as a service. So this company uh, on the left-hand side, Starsky Robotics, uh, they do autonomous trucks for long-haul trucking in the United States. That's their business model, is they provide a robotic platform that truck companies can use to ship stuff from one place to another. It's not entirely autonomous. Maybe 90, 95% of the time it's completely autonomous. But when it isn't autonomous, when the environment is too tricky, uh, the robot can be remotely operated by somebody over a 4G link uh, to drive it the tricky bits, maybe on and, off the, on and off the highway. But for the highway driving, autonomous. Similar thing for uh, uh, Starship on the right-hand side. This is a food delivery robot uh, used in some US campuses now, US university campuses. And again, some, mostly autonomous, but there are people in the back office who can joystick the robot if it gets to a place where uh, the robot is confused. So it's an interesting model. We know that autonomy is not perfect, but it's pretty good, and you can create a business by using, employing humans to do just that 5% of the time when the robot would otherwise get stuck. It means you can get robots out into the field and earning money. So robotics as a service is coming. We talked a bit about driving. Uh, Humans driving cars is a dangerous business. 1.2 million people a year killed uh, across the planet. Uh, it's going to become a leading cause of death uh, moving forward as we conquer a lot of the diseases uh, and uh, lifestyle and lifestyle issues. Then driving driving fatalities is going to rise up the the league table of uh, ways we kill ourselves, uh, which is problematic. This is an interesting graph. Uh, shows road traffic deaths per 100,000 population. Africa is not doing very well there, and the trend is in the wrong direction. We also see here that in Africa, a very large, a larger proportion of pedestrian accidents happening than in other parts of the world. So this is from a recent uh, WHO report. Uh, so 1.2 million people a year killed. So the, what people who working in the field of self-driving cars say is, OK, Robots could drive the cars, or AI could drive the cars much better than humans. So we could, we could make a massive improvement here. So let's say that uh, we eliminated 99% of road fatalities, right? What do we got left? Only 100,000 people a year killed. They're killed by robots now, and not killed by humans. And I think this will take society a little time to accept. There's a huge public good here, right? 1.1 million people now live every year that otherwise would have been killed by humans. But I think this many people killed by robots, that might be hard to stomach. I mean, so far, self-driving cars have killed only a handful of people. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, and caused much less outrage than I would ever have expected. I, I kind of thought once the one person had been killed by a self-driving car, it'd be all over. But no, people want this technology. So we're interested to see how this plays out. What's that? Who do you sue? 
Uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, this is a. This is a big. This is a big issue. You probably sue the manufacturer. I mean, you sue everyone you can think of, right? That's that's the way it goes. Uh, but and the man, and the manufacturers would have insurance to cover this. So uh, this is all to be decided. But I think it'll also be a big equity issue because if you're a country that doesn't have very high quality roads, uh, that the sort of roads that these cars are expect, then you're not going to be able to use the technology. The technology also requires that the roads are mapped to incredible detail, and that's a big cost for the car companies to do all this mapping. So you know, this is not just going to be—you can't just snap your fingers and have autonomous cars in a country. There's a big campaign, a big investment uh, is needed in the infrastructure and in mapping. Work. Lots of people ask me about robots and jobs, and this is the thing that does actually worry me quite a bit. It's interesting to make the distinction between work, which is the stuff that we want to do, like travel to interesting conferences and talk to people, and labour, which is the stuff that we have to do, like washing dishes, right, or building a pyramid. Uh, and we've all, humans have always sought to not do the labour bit. We don't like the labour, and so we've enlisted uh, slaves, animals, wind power, water power, steam power. In the future, it's going to be robots, right, to help us do the labour, the stuff that we don't want to do. And there is this thing, this paradox of work, right? Over time, the population's got bigger. There are more people in work today than there ever has been, right? Despite huge technological change in the West, despite women going to work when they didn't used to go to work. So the workforce has absorbed a huge number of people, more people at work than ever, ever before. Uh, and technologies have come and gone, and a lot of people say, well, with robots, it's just going to be the same thing all over again. But I have my doubts about this because robots are fundamentally different. They can do work that humans can do. You don't have to pay them a salary. Uh, and I think maybe we're already beginning to see that. There was an article this morning in the, uh, on BBC News, uh, that was seven hours ago this morning. Oxford Economics just put out yet another report uh, and saying, uh, yeah, 20 million factory jobs to go. And that's just factory jobs. But they're also quite bullish about the upside as well. So they're talking about job shifts from one sector to another. Uh, here's just a uh, list of some of the jobs that have gone over time, and maybe you can recognise some of these. I've uh, got printers, chimney sweeps, gas lighters, coal delivery people, uh, telephone installers, uh, telephone exchange workers, typing pools. All of these professions no longer exist, but all those people have gone on to, we assume, something else. And so this, is, this graph, that this line here, shows what's happening to real wage growth in my country. And it's something that's causing a lot of unrest. So we've had a big financial crash in 2010, and now we're having a financial recovery. Nobody feels like there's been a financial recovery. In real terms, people's salaries are going down. And I think, why is that? And I think that is we're starting to see the impact of automation, AI, more than robots, uh, on on this, unions are not as strong as they used to be. And I think now, workers are price takers. They used to be price setters. When they were organised and you know, well organised, right, they could demand a salary of the, of, the, of the employer. Not anymore. They take the price that they can get. Uh, and here's the thing. Labour is replaced with capital. Right? You could employ a person and pay them a salary. We could buy a machine. One-off capex expenditure. And you can probably depreciate it on your tax. Right? So we are make, we're tilting the landscape away from, away from human beings and in favour of machines. Uh, and there's a lot of talk in some countries, particularly in the United States, about off reshoring jobs. So a lot of jobs went offshore to China, and some people want to bring them back to the United States. They won't come back. 10% of them will come back, because it's cheaper to replace them with robots than to bring all those jobs back to mainland United States. So, yeah, that, this is a really big issue, I think, for this particular field. And we worry about robot armies. Uh, you know, it's kind of a nightmare scenario. It's here, right? We have drones killing people uh, now. Uh, but they're killed with human... Humans are in the loop. They're pushing the button that does the killing. But there's a big debate going on at the moment in the United Nations about lethal uh, and should they be outlawed. And a lethal autonomous weapon is a machine that makes a decision to kill a human being all by itself. Uh, and a lot of people think that that's a line that we should never cross. Uh, not all countries believe that that's a line that we should not cross. 
Uh, so it's quite an interesting debate, and there's a lot of very a lot of people in the technology field, you know, playing into into this debate. Very very important. Uh, privacy. You, we worry about things like CCTV cameras on buildings. Every Tesla car has got six cameras. It's logging 40 megabytes of visual data every second. If you've got a, a, a a city full of Tesla cars, you've got amazing sort of surveillance of everything that's going on in that city. Who controls where this data goes? Uh, we haven't talked about that at all. Uh, example from my lab, we've been using these kind of robots for medical interventions, getting the robot to talk to people and confessing their problems. Uh, and we found robots are People are much happier to talk to a robot about what's wrong with their life than, than they are to talk to a family member. But what, happen, what happens to the data from, from the robots, right? It goes into the cloud somewhere. Uh, and we're not having debates at all about what happens to this data. There's no patient, we have patient doctor confidentiality. Patient robot confidentiality is not a thing yet, right? Uh, so in summary, uh, sorry I've gone on a little long. Robots are still coming. They're going to be very diverse in their form and function, right? They're not going to look like the, like the Hollywood things that I showed Ryan at the beginning. They're going to look like trucks. They're going to look like cars. They're going to look like helicopters. Uh, what they do governs what they'll look like. You're going to see them moving into all sorts of industry sectors they're not in at the moment. They'll be able to see deep learning is going to drive them. Uh, there are going to be some societal impacts we need to have conversations about. And the value proposition and what are the applications that make sense in South Africa or Africa in general.